on Wednesday night for a few weeks, uh, I love to study the Bible. I love to study God's Word, and I'd like to just start with the basics. I'm a brand new pastor. I've never pastored a church before, amen, so uh, I, I uh, appreciate your patience with me, but I'd like to just start very simple, and I'd like to start with what I believe needs to be, needs to be covered in every church. Amen, whether it's at the very beginning, like me, or whether down the road. But I'd like to start out with this. We're going to start in 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. The basis for building a church... And the reason we have a church is because of the gospel. Amen. The reason, the purpose of the church is to give the gospel. And so I'd like to start tonight for everybody. Everybody's got it. Here we go. Amen. First John chapter 5. We're going to start. Start here. Chapter, uh, First John chapter 5, verse number 10. The Bible says, He that believeth on the Son... Of God hath the, wit hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record that God hath given to us, eternal life, and this life is in his Son. I believe that every church, and I believe that us as a, as a, uh, a growing church, as, a start, as we're starting back up, I believe that we all need to understand whether you've been in church for a long period of time, whether you're brand new to church, it's always good to understand salvation. It's always good to go over and refresh yourself of the gospel because the Bible says that is the power unto salvation. We need to understand who we are in Christ and we need to examine ourselves, as the Bible says, if we are in Christ. Amen. Just because you come to church does not mean you're born again. Amen. We have to understand that. We're a church, and I believe that everybody here is saved. But if you're not, you have to understand it's not by coming to church that makes you born again. Amen. And I'd like us to grow, but we can never grow past salvation. If you're not saved, you'll never grow past salvation. You have to be saved first to grow as a Christian. And this is the record that we see there in verse 11. This is the record that God hath given to us eternal life. God has given it to us. Amen. It is a free gift. Now, another reason for going over salvation, I believe, the very beginning to start out, amen, to start out as in the fundamentals of our church is because maybe you know you are saved, you've been born again. This will help you to know how to maybe give the gospel. Maybe you say, you know, I, I know that I'm saved, but I don't quite know how to give the gospel. Well, then tonight I'd like to help you understand maybe a little bit of how to give the gospel, what verses to use and give you some verses to study, help you get, kind of get a basis uh, and understanding of how to uh, maybe approach somebody that you uh, would like to give the gospel to. But we start here. Uh, the Bible says like, God had given to us eternal life. Eternal life is a free gift. Amen. You don't have to earn it. You don't got to come to church and uh, get baptized and be a member and be a deacon and do a list of good things. Eternal life is a free gift that is given to us, but it's because of Jesus Christ. Amen. You have to look at it as uh, eternal life is a gift that has been bought by Jesus, and we have to go to Jesus to get it. Nothing else could buy eternal life. Your eternal life that you have, if you're born again, was bought and paid for by the blood of Christ. Without Christ, there would be no eternal life. Amen. Don't trust in this church to get you to heaven. You'll go straight to hell. Don't trust in anybody else. Don't trust in me. I'm a sinner as your pastor. I'll be the first to admit it. And uh, my wife will be before me the first to admit it. And, uh, you know, you're not going to live with anybody long enough to find out you're not perfect. Amen. That's why we need to be saved. So that takes us to num point number one, the condition of man. To understand salvation, we have to understand our condition. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. Very simple, very common verses. But if you're not familiar with these verses, I would write them down. 
These are verses that you can take your friends, take your neighbors, take your co-workers, take whoever that you know if they're not born again and help them to understand their need of the gospel. But they have to understand, number one, their condition. Romans chapter 3, verse 23, the Bible says, For what? All. What did it, what's it say, class? For all have sinned. Everybody is a sinner. Now, sin, we know, is anything we do that God says not to do. Amen? Anything bad is what you could say. Uh, uh, also, another verse, Romans 3.10, it says there, as it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. Everybody's a sinner. Nobody's perfect. Why? Because, look there also, Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Sometimes, uh, when you ask individuals, say, well, what is sin? Everybody has a different idea of what sin is. You know, some things that they, they don't look at that that's wrong. The world looks at some things that it's perfectly normal. They don't think that that's sin. Now, we know according to God's Word, there are things that, that sin that it, to the world they consider perfectly normal. But that's because we do not base sin off of our interpretation of sin. We base sin off of God's interpretation. You compare yourself to God, and it doesn't matter if you're the president, doesn't matter if you're a millionaire, doesn't matter if you're Donald Trump. You'll always fall short of God's glory. Every man compared to God is a sinner, and God is perfect. And so you say, and you tell somebody, you're a sinner. Well, how do you know? Ask them, are you perfect? And they say, and I've had people tell me, well, yeah, I'm perfect. I don't know if you've ever had anybody tell you that, but I looked at them like, you got to be kidding me. And then I tell them, say, then would you compare yourself to God? And if they've got any brain at all, they'll say no. If they don't and they say yes, then you can just stop right there because they'll never get saved until they're willing to admit they're a sinner. You'll never get saved until you're willing to admit you're not perfect, that you have sin. And so Romans 3.23 is a great place to start. For all have sinned, everybody. And, you, and people can tell you they're not sinners all day long, but God knows the sin. That's why I like. It's God that said all have sinned. God sees your life 24-7. And I tell people when I'm giving the gospel, God knows every sin that you've ever done. I don't. You can lie to me and tell me you're not a sinner. But you can't lie to God. God knows your sin. And so we have to understand our condition. We're sinners. A good way to put it is, uh, if two people were playing a game of darts, one person's dart may miss the board altogether, and the other person's dart may be within an inch of the bullseye. However, only one spot on the board is the mark, or is the bullseye. The condition of man is like that dart. Some have missed the mark, or some have missed perfection by a long way. And some have missed it by not much. But everyone has missed the mark. You may not be like the murderer that's in prison, but if you've told one single lie, then you've missed the mark. God says you'd, if you'd wanted to get to heaven, He said you'd have to be perfect. And it doesn't matter whether you've told, whether you've done every sin in the book, or whether you're a good moral person and you've only told one lie in your life as a child, you've missed that mark. And you're worthy of hell. We have to understand our condition. Romans 3.10 again, as is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Righteousness can be defined as equitable in character or act. Innocent, holy. To be righteous would then mean that a person would be without sin or perfect. And we know that there is none. That's why God says there's none righteous. No, not one. Amen. Now, number two. We have to understand, number one, the condition of man. Then we have to understand the consequences of sin. Romans 6.23 is where we can start. I'm giving you very basic verses. Maybe you've never heard this before. Write these verses down. Study them. Use them to, give, to tell others about Christ. Romans 6.23 states, For the wages of sin is death. That word wages there, I've always told it, whenever I've given the gospel, means a payment. When you go and you work a job, you get a wage. 
You've get, you get paid for what you've done. Wages is a payment. The payment of sin is death. Now, there are two deaths. Okay? We all die physically. Everybody here will die one day. Amen? That is your first death. And then when you go to the book of Revelations, it talks about a second death. In fact, you know what? I didn't write it down, but let's go there. We're going to go to Revelations. Hold on. Let me turn there in my Bible. That way you can see it. You can write down Revelations uh, chapter 20, verse 13. Revelations 20, verse 13 and 14. The Bible says, And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man according to their works, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Salvation, when you get born again, it delivers you from the second death. It does not deliver you from your first death, and that is your physical death. This body will pass away. You not, you're not getting any younger. You're going to pass away. You're going to die one day. Salvation will save you from the penalty of the second death. That is the consequence of sin. If you have sinned today and your sin is not paid for, then your punishment is the second death, and that is hell. Again, that's Revelations 20, 13, and 14. Amen. Hell or death is uh, referred to as eternal separation from God. Amen. If a man received his wages for sin or his payment, he would deserve to die and spend eternity in hell. But, amen, praise God for salvation. That's what brings us to number three. I don't spend a whole lot of time on that uh, because you meet people that either believe in hell or they don't. Amen? And uh, if they believe it, you're not going to have to convince them too long. Amen? You say, there is a hell, and they'll agree with you, or they say, I don't believe in hell, then you're probably talking to like a Mormon or Jehovah's Witness or somebody like that. All right? Now, number three. Notice these are all alliterated. I like alliteration. So we have the, uh, number one, we have the condition of man, the consequences of sin, and number three, the Christ of salvation. The Christ of salvation. Up to this point, if you're giving this, if you're giving the gospel, or you're telling somebody exactly what I'm telling you, up to this point, all they think is doom and gloom. I'm bound for hell. Okay? So this is the turning point. This is where you say, but there's hope. Amen. The, so far, the picture in their mind is that Christianity is all about hell. This is where you turn it and you say, but there's a way out. Amen. Man is sinful and deserves to pay for his sin in a place called hell. However, the story doesn't end there. You go back to Romans 6.23 and you read the last part of that verse. It says, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ Christ our Lord. Now, there is a reason we believe the King James Bible, because it has not, they have not taken the words out. Amen. Notice the wording of your Bible. Number one, it says, but the gift of God is eternal life. Eternal life is a gift. It is free. It is not earned. You let them know they do not have to earn salvation. You do not have to earn heaven. You do not have to have merits to get to heaven. You don't have to look at God one day and have a balance of good and bad and the good outweigh the bad. God says it is a gift. But then you read the rest of it and, they, and you tell them, say, eternal life is a gift, but who do you get that gift from? And look what it says, through Jesus Christ our Lord. And then I love what's there. A period. That means it stops there. <laughs> you don't add to it, okay? If they say that they add to, that they have to also go to church, they're not saved. Because you do not add to salvation. Salvation, this gift of God is eternal life, and it's only through the blood of Jesus Christ, period. If you did not trust Jesus as your Savior and only Christ, you are not born again. That's all there is to it. According to God's Word, it is through Jesus Christ. If you got saved by joining this church, you're not born again. If you got saved by baptism, then you're not born again. 
If you got saved because mom and dad told you so, and not born again. If you got saved because you had an experience where you thought that you met Jesus, you think I'm crazy, but one time I was in a trailer park knocking on doors, and I knock on it. said, hello, I'm from the Riverside Baptist Church. My name is Richard Halen. I'd like to invite you to church. And I asked them, do you know that if you died, you'd go to heaven 100% sure? And they said, oh, yes, I know. And I said, how do you know? Well, I died. And I saw a bright light at the end of a tunnel. And I went through and I saw the light. This is a true story. Okay, I'm not making this up. And they said, I saw a bright light. I walked to it and Jesus told me that I was going to heaven. And I woke up. He said, so I know I'm going to heaven. I said, well, that is wonderful. I've never heard a story like that. I tell them, say, but that's not what the Bible says. <laughs> say, before I believe you and you've only lived about 30 years of your life up to that point, say, I'm going to believe God who's been around a little bit longer. Amen. Take them to the Bible. Use God's Word. This is our authority. This is what our faith is in. Amen. This is what makes the difference. This is the anchor of our faith. The rock. Amen. God, Jesus is the rock of our salvation. The cornerstone. He is the Word of God. Use His Word. Amen. If they do not proclaim faith and trust in Christ, they do not have true salvation. You can tell them, you may have some kind of salvation, but it's not true salvation. Amen. Some people think that they escape because they escaped in, a, in a, a physical punishment. I've had people tell me, well, God saved me from a car wreck, so I know that I'm going to heaven because God has kept me alive up to this point. And they feel that God has a purpose for them, so that means they're going to heaven. You tell them, say, God does have a purpose for you, but God's kept you alive so that I could give you the gospel to tell you if you don't have Christ, you're going to die and spend eternity in hell. Amen. A lot of people view church as a way to get out. Uh, you know, they, they come to church not to get saved, but to get out of a physical punishment. You know, some people, you know, when they get sentenced to go to jail, what do they do? They come to church. You know, like Pastor said the other night, I've met people like that. And some people think maybe they've had an experience, a physical experience, that means that they're saved. And that's not how that works. Amen. If they don't have Christ, you're not born again. Amen. Romans 5.8 is also another verse. It's very simple. It explains how Christ showed His love, but God commendeth His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I love that verse to use if maybe you meet somebody that they have a life full of sin. Maybe they have a record. Maybe they have done quite a bit and they're ashamed of that. You show them that verse and show how that Jesus died knowing they were a sinner. It says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You show them that Jesus loved them so much that He died for them even while He knew that what they had done. He knew they were a sinner. Um, you can compare. Uh, we, uh, often a good, a good illustration to use is, a Chris, is at Christmas time, how that we give gifts and it's free. Uh, I always tell them, I say, if I uh, give you a gift at Christmas and then I ask you to wash my car because I gave you that, that's not a gift, amen. If I uh, tell you, you got to shine my boots and then you can have the gift that I bought you. That's not a gift, amen. A gift is free. Uh, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 is a great verse. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Uh, Titus 3, 5, you can write that one down, look at that one later, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 4 talks about, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Amen. I always at least show them something with that verse or something to let them know that Jesus didn't just stay dead. Okay, don't leave Jesus dead. Amen. De Jesus didn't just die. He also rose again. He conquered death to prove to us that He could conquer death for us as well. If Jesus would have died and stayed in the grave, he'd, been like, he'd have been like every other man. But Jesus was God and He proved it by raising from the dead. He rose again so that He could give us eternal life. Amen. Now, last, number four, the choice of man. The choice of man. So up to this point, the gospel is very simple. Understand their, they need to understand their condition. Number two, number two, they need to understand the consequence of sin. Number three, they need to understand Christ 
the Christ of salvation. Number four, they need to understand the choice. The choice. As with any gift, the gift of salvation must be received. Um, God has given man a free will. That means we have the choice to either receive the gift of salvation or refuse the gift of salvation. God has given us the power to choose. Amen. God will not come down and force men to accept this gift. You let them know they have to make a decision about Christ. Every child has to make a decision one day of what they will do with Jesus, whether they will accept Him or reject Him. Some people stay neutral. They never make a decision. They just continue to come to church and just continue to think they're saved. Well, I'm just, I've just always been saved. They never make a decision. God says you either accept or refuse. If you've never accepted, every other decision means hell. Amen. You have, they have to make a decision about Christ. God has left that choice up to each individual. You cannot make that choice for anybody else but yourself. Your parents cannot make that decision for you. Your grandparents cannot make that decision for you. You cannot make that decision for your children. Every individual at one point in time must make a decision about Christ. The Holy Spirit will convict every person's heart and give you an opportunity to receive Jesus Christ. Uh, Romans 10, 13, if you're not familiar with, uh, well, let's, Romans 10, 9, if you're not familiar with uh, the Bible or where that would be at, Romans chapter 10, verse number 9, great place to go. And there's, and there's so many more verses, amen, we can just, we can go through it. And in time, we'll get more into it and, and do more verses, but I'd like to just give you a basis, give you the basics, amen. Start out simple. Romans chapter 10, verse number 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. These verses show us that man has to make a decision. We have to make a decision to receive, to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And don't let people tell you, I've had people try to tell me this, well, if you believe, that's a work. That's a bunch of hogwash. You tell them, say, you don't know what you're talking about. The reason they say that is because they've never believed on Christ and they don't want to. They just want to justify themselves. Uh, believing is not a work, amen. Believing takes no effort, amen. God says it's not by works of righteousness, amen. Works of righteousness, going to church, baptism, all of those things. Those are all works of righteousness, works of things that we do uh, in church. Believing is not a work, amen. Believing is a decision that you make. What it is, the Bible talks about in the book of Romans, that faith cometh, uh, or, and this is in uh, uh, Hebrews, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Uh, and then in Romans, it talks about how that faith is mingled in our hearts. Uh, it's mingled, and that produces salvation. When the word of God is preached or when it is given, when you present the gospel, faith comes as a result of hearing the word of God. So in every person that you ever get a chance to give the gospel, you give them God's word, God gives them faith from His word. They now have to take that faith that God has given to them and choose to place that in Jesus Christ. That's salvation. Amen. The Bible says it's mingled. They have to mingle that faith with Jesus. If they mingle faith with anything else, they mingle faith with their church. If they mingle faith with the Pope, if they mingle faith with anything else, then it does not produce salvation. Okay, it's kind of like you know chemistry. If you if you put the wrong two components together, you get bad reactions. <laughs> and uh, ask uh, Wes, an architect, uh, you know, if you put two wrong things together, a uh, building doesn't stand. <laughs> I don't know what those are. He'll give you a list of things later, amen, if you want to build something. But if, the blue, if you don't follow the blueprints, there we go, we'll do it that way. You don't follow the blueprints, you won't get the same result. A lot of people try to get salvation by not following God's blueprint, amen. A lot of people try to make their own. A lot of people try to mingle faith with something else, and they don't produce the same result. 
Faith has to be mingled with Jesus for salvation. Mingled with anything else in your life or somebody else's does not produce salvation. Amen. So they have to make a choice. They have to choose to believe in Jesus Christ. What did the Philippian jailer ask Paul? What must I do to be saved? He said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Amen. They just have to believe on Christ. Now that belief will come as a, and, or what comes as a result of believing is that they will call on Jesus. Amen. If you believe, amen, and I know for me, I uh, made a choice to trust Jesus as my Savior there at camp when Brother Dignan was preaching. I didn't want to go to hell. I turned around. What was the result? I called on Jesus and I asked him to save me. That's why it says, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Amen. You believe, it'll come out your mouth. Amen. You believe and you'll tell everybody about it. Amen. You'll confess Christ. Amen. But so that's why we, and then Romans 10, 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We always uh, tell people when we're giving the gospel, we, I give everybody an opportunity right there and then to pray and ask Jesus to save them. Pray and ask them to put their faith and trust in Jesus and receive that gift. Amen. Uh, and that's uh, salvation. Amen. When you got saved, you put your faith and trust in Jesus, you believed on Christ, and you asked Him for that gift of eternal life. Amen. That's why, again, we go back to verse 9, that thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised Him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. Amen. Uh, look at, and you say, well, uh, give you an illustration, the thief on the cross. Okay, he believed that Jesus could save him, and he wasn't looking to get out of a physical death, but he asked Jesus to remember him when he gets to heaven. Jesus says, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. He believed, and as a result of that belief, that faith in Christ in his heart, he confessed Christ. He asked Jesus for that gift of salvation. And that's salvation, amen. Somebody comes down to an old-fashioned altar, they believe and they put their faith and trust in Jesus and ask Jesus to save them. That is salvation, amen. And uh, don't let people tell you, well, if... You know, prayer is a work, and, that, and it's a bunch of nonsense. Amen. People try to get critical. They try to. What they're trying to do is get out of this. That all they have to do is trust Christ because they don't want to trust Christ. Amen. They want to make it as complicated as possible. The gospel is simple. Amen. All you have to do is believe. Amen. All you have to do is put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Amen. And sometimes we think, well. And, and this is for maybe, maybe, you, maybe you're doubting tonight. I mean, I know I doubted uh, as a teenager uh, for a long time because I thought, well, maybe I didn't pray the right words. <laughs> Amen. Or maybe I didn't say it the right way. Or well, like we were talking uh, last Sunday, maybe I didn't say, or not the Sunday before, maybe I didn't say please. <laughs> uh, God's not looking for a set of words. Amen. That's what the Catholics do. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us his day our daily bread. That's, that, that's, that works. Amen. You have to pray a specific prayer. No, 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 no. You believe, and whether you say, Dear Jesus, forgive me for my sin, or you say like the thief on the cross, Lord, remember me. God's not looking for a set of words. God's looking for the faith in your heart. God knows where you're placing your faith. And if you're placing your faith in Jesus, whether you say, Jesus, save me now, or you pray a five-minute long etiquette prayer, Jesus will save you. Amen. Uh, Dr. Bob Gray used to always give an illustration of uh, a lady coming down the aisle that was very formal and getting saved and compared to a poor man that comes and sobs and, and cries and bawls his eyes out. One goes back and no tears and just simply prays a simple prayer. The other person is uh, begging God for five minutes. Both are saved. Amen. Okay. God's not looking for a show. God's not looking for emotions. God's not looking for words. God's looking for faith. Amen. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith? That's what God's looking for. Amen. And where you place that faith determines where you spend eternity. Amen. The gift of eternal life is really the same as a pardon, a pardon for the sin that man has committed. Uh, here's an illustration uh, here for you. Under President Andrew Jackson's administration, a very strange thing happened. Uh, a railway mail clerk named George Wilson killed his co-worker and tied himself up to make it appear that a train robbery had occurred. However, during the routine questioning, a few flaws were found in his testimony, and he broke down and confessed the crime. 
which brought the death sentence. After a series of unusual events, President Jackson granted a pardon. Then the worldwide news was made when the prisoner refused to accept the pardon. Not knowing what to do with the prisoner, this case finally was sent to the Supreme Court, and Justice John Marshall wrote in the decision, A pardon is a paper, the value of which depends upon its acceptance by the person implicated. It is hardly to be supposed that one under sentence of death would refuse to accept a pardon, but if it is refused, it is no pardon. George Wilson must hang. Mr. Wilson died for his sin. No different is the person who rejects the pardon Christ freely offers today. Jesus died for everybody. But if you don't make a personal decision to trust Christ for yourself, then it doesn't matter what Jesus did for you. Amen because you're not saved. You have to receive that pardon that Jesus gave for you by faith. Amen. And it's the same for everybody. You can tell them, Jesus came, Jesus died, He's done His part. Amen. God will not fail. Amen. God uh, does not lie. Amen. According to the book of Titus. But, if we make the decision to refuse, then I don't want to say that Jesus died in vain, but if you, don't, if you refuse Christ, it's like, it's like you're telling Jesus he died in vain. You know, say, you know, that's like saying, no thanks. Appreciate you doing all that for me, but too bad. Amen? So, now the Bible clearly teaches uh, there are two types of people, those who believe and those who do not believe. John 3.36 is a good verse. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. If they accept Jesus as their Savior, I like to use this verse to remind them that if you believe, you have everlasting life. And if you do not believe, you will not see life. So God uh, separates people. Amen. There are two types of people in this room. Those who have believed and those who have not. Amen. I pray that everybody here has accepted Jesus as their Savior and believed. But if not, then you fall into the last category of those that believe not. And you'll not see life. Amen. But the wrath of God abideth on him. Amen. So there's two types of people in the world. When you go out, everybody you meet, they're either one of two people. They're either, they've either believed on the Son and they have everlasting life or they've not believed the Son. This is where you can tell them there is no purgatory. God says if you've either believed or you've not, you don't spend somewhere in the middle in limbo waiting for somebody to get you out. Amen. Either you believed and you have everlasting life or you believed not and you'll not see life. You'll spend eternity in hell. Amen. Each individual must make the choice to accept or refuse the pardon. Amen. And uh, next week we'll go over uh, baptism. I have a, a lot that I, uh, I like to do about baptism and, uh, and like to uh, just talk to you a little bit about it. It's always good to be reminded of what baptism means. But today I want to just to be basic, just be simple. Amen. I pray that everybody here knows that they're born again. If you don't know if you're saved, maybe you realize tonight through the message, through the study, that you don't know if you're born again, then come talk to me. Amen. I'm your pastor. Amen. Call me. Amen. Uh, uh, ladies, I prefer that you would call my wife if you'd like to get a hold of us. And I'd love to speak with you, uh, bring you to my office, uh, and, uh, and we'd like to give you the gospel. Amen. If you don't know, or if maybe you have some doubts, amen, the Bible talks about that. Christians can doubt. Amen. And uh, you need to be, uh, you need some encouragement. Whatever you need, I'd like to talk to you. But we have to start with salvation. The church will never grow. You will never grow until you nail down salvation. Amen. Until you nail down. Now, I told